In 1931, Edith and Arthur Lee bought this house in South Minneapolis. It's near 46th Street and Columbus Avenue, and the black couple's decision to buy a home on an all-white block enraged their neighbors. Neighbors tried to buy the property and vandalize the home. And in July of that year, an angry mob of thousands gathered on their lawn to protest. The Lees didn't stay in that house. Two years later, they moved to a historically black neighborhood in South Minneapolis. But still, Edith and Arthur Lee's story is one of resistance, testing the boundaries of racial segregation. At the time, in the early years of the 20th century, property owners were starting to write in racially restrictive covenants into their property deeds to legally define who could buy their home. These covenants outlined a list of, quote, undesirable people from Asians to Jews, but they were used as a tool primarily targeting black Americans to keep them out of certain neighborhoods and cities around the country. They started in California in the late 1800s and spread through the United States and were upheld by a Supreme Court decision in 1926. Kirsten Delegard works with Mapping Prejudice, a project at the University of Minnesota that helps look for and identify covenants around the Twin Cities. When researchers have started, have gone looking for covenants, they have never not found them. In every city and suburban area in the country, they were used in white, well-off neighborhoods and new property developments to shape the landscape of the city and keep black people from buying homes. Minneapolis was no different. And by the time they were outright banned in 1953, the damage was already done. The first racially restrictive covenant in Minneapolis was written in 1910, when Henry and Lenora Scott sold a home on 36th Avenue South to a man named Nels Anderson. Scott would go on to establish a real estate development company with a man named Edmund Walton, the namesake of Edmund Boulevard along the Mississippi River. I think it was a little bit of an experiment on the part of a developer who was, um, you know, toying with, with different ways to make, uh, to add value to properties. The first <laughs> racial covenant that was put in place, it was had this long laundry list of people, the, the undesirable people, the people who couldn't live there. You know, that was sort of the experimental first step, but then he added that same language into thousands and thousands of other deeds across Hennepin and Ramsey County over, you know, over the next less than a decade. On a national level, the 1917 Supreme Court case, Buchanan versus Warley, had banned government instituted racial segregation, saying it was a direct violation of the fundamental law of the 14th Amendment. So racial covenants became a way for homeowners themselves to quietly enforce boundaries and white supremacy, all while hiding behind the fine print of a long legal document. I mean, so part of, part of the thinking behind covenants is that, um, you know, so-called, I'm gonna use air quotes here, so-called respectful white people didn't wanna be out burning crosses and, um, and threatening violence in a face-to-face -face kind of way with, pe with, with black people who might want to live in their neighborhood, who might want to own property. Um, they preferred to put up the barriers through these very dry legal documents. But of course, people resisted. In 1904, a black man named John Scott bought a small holding of land on 50th in France with a vision to create a black enclave and secure autonomy for his family. He named the area Evelyn's Addition after his daughter. You know, like you can say, oh, that's very sweet and sentimental, but it also feels like this um, profound act of resistance to me, too. You know, so here's here's this moment in time um, where, uh, you know, black women, you know, no women have the vote, right? And black women are, <laughs> you know, certainly disenfranchised in so many ways. So the idea that he would um, name this, pars this, this large parcel of land for his daughter, like making, sort of claiming this place for her just seems very, um, very profound to me. But just a couple of blocks south of the newly platted Evelyn's Edition, Twin Cities real estate leaders called the Thorpe Brothers bought 300 acres of land. 
They made that land, with its many tree-lined streets and parks, one of the most racially restricted developments in the country, and it's now known as the Edina Country Club area. At the same time, John Scott started selling part of his land to the Minneapolis School Board and to a woman named Mary Hummel. When Hummel sold that land in 1925, she added a covenant into the deed, making sure that the land, which was once owned by a black family, became inaccessible to them in the future. Scott died in 1931, and his family lost the six lots of land to real estate taxes and foreclosure, and what was an oasis was surrounded by some of the most racially restricted landscapes in the city. There are other stories of resistance, like Edith and Arthur Lees, of other black Minneapolis residents buying a home in South Minneapolis and trying to stay even as they face pressure to move. Emanuel Cohen, a Jewish man, lobbied local legislators to pass a bill that banned the religious discrimination like Walton advertised, which passed in 1919. In 1948, the Supreme Court deemed racially restricted deeds were unenforceable. Five years later, the Minnesota legislature banned covenants based on religious faith, creed, race, or color. And then finally, the Fair Housing Act, part of the Civil Rights Act, brought covenants to an end. But even as covenants saw their decline in those 20 years, the history is still much more complicated. The 1948 Shelley v. Kramer only prohibited the enforcement of the deeds, which meant homeowners could still write them in. In December of 1952, over 25 covenants were registered in Hennepin County. And across the river in St. Paul, the same story holds true. There aren't as many covenants because the city is smaller and was founded earlier. St. Paul seemed to have started putting covenants in place at the same time as Minneapolis. It was probably the same developers. Areas built in the 1910s through the 1940s, like Como Park and Highland Park, are covered in covenants. So a neighborhood covered in covenants signaled to people of color that they were still not welcome. The legacies of these covenants continue to be so powerful because just stopping a practice that is harmful is not the same as repairing the damage that was done by that practice. And once once these inequities and once these disparities are created through a, you know close to a century of policy and practice, you can't just say, okay, we're done now, and everybody everybody you know continue you know continue as as you know go forward and everything's fine. Covenants irreparably divided the city, which has one of the worst homeownership rates for people of color in the country. In 2016, the Met Council said white households' homeownership rate is triple that of black households in the Twin Cities. That impacts accessibility to jobs, transportation, air quality, and entry to schools. You know, I always tell folks that, you know, history endures, and I feel like there is a history of urban disinvestment um, and devaluation of particular populations left behind in some urban central cities that are you know, hugely important to understand. As Minneapolis and surrounding areas started to develop, you can see how the covenants concentrated around areas near parks. And you also see how they pushed black Minnesotans into smaller and smaller communities as space expanded for white people in the outer areas of the city. Mapping Prejudice says homes with covenants have a four to 15% higher present day value than those without. Gentrification is a market process. It was always going to happen. At the heart of it, it's economic, right? How we value different people's work and expertise um, and or even different racial ethnic groups access to getting the education to get trained i think to have the expertise they so choose which provides them what you call economic mobility um, which many folks never receive Lewis says the disinvestment is strategic and racial covenants are one of the ways white supremacy has strategically shaped Minneapolis. Over 25,000 racially restrictive covenants have been found in Hennepin County alone. But there's work being done to acknowledge and amend that history. The Just Deeds Project helps homeowners disavow covenants. 
And it was very important to that group, and I think for everyone, to not remove language because you erase history and you lose that context. So when we say disavow the covenant, what we're talking about is really adding another piece of paper to the file that is your property deed to say, uh, as a property owner, I do not agree with this practice. I, you know, that's what disavow means. I don't agree with this practice. So far, they've partnered with 14 cities around the metro and discharged over 100 covenants. So some of the biggest gains that we've made have come from community members because they always are asking us what's next. Um, and so, you know, we leave it up to them and let them dream. But it's been, you know, creating yard signs and um, creating community events around racially, like, systemic racism and having conversations the community is just ready um and you know their step and that's really the the premise of it step one is disavowing the covenant right or you could say step one is learning step two is disavowing the covenant and step three is choose your own adventure and community has been doing a lot of choosing their own adventure <laughs>